Hello, how's it going? You know what's useless but pretty in games? Boys, flocks, swarms, schools. It feels like video games that have extra CPU cycles always want to show it off by having some boys in the background to show you they're doing okay performance wise. So today we're doing the, we're making uh, boys. That, that's it, that's the intro. <laughs> The way boids work is, they don't have a manager overseeing and coordinating the movements of all the boids together. Instead, each entity decides where to go and what to do based on its environment and a set of simple rules. Let's define the environment first. Each boid keeps an updated list of neighboring boids. For now, we'll just iterate over the list of all boids in the scene, but we'll fix that later, and filter it to only keep the ones that are within a certain radius. We also only keep the ones that are in our field of vision that we can simply do by testing the dot product of the line of sight of the void and the direction vector that links it to another void. That's about it for now. List of friends that are next to us. Let's talk rules. By default, a void just goes forward without thinking. Each rule will have an impact on the direction by slightly steering the void. The three basic rules are separation, alignment and cohesion. Separation is just like avoidance. To avoid running into each other, they steer away from the crowd. The way I implemented that is by having every neighbor exert a force on the void, the intensity of which decreases with the distance between the two voids. Sum each of them and you got yourself your separation steering force. Next is alignment. Voids will try to go in the general direction as other voids are going. This is basically the same as the separation rule, but instead of steering away from neighbors, the weighted sum of vectors uses the line of sight vector of the neighbors. With this rule, you kinda see a group behavior emerge all of a sudden, which is pretty cool. Although, they quickly end up all facing the same direction, so we need a final rule. Cohesion. A void will find the center of all of its neighbors and try to head towards that. Which means, when they're all going the same direction like before, if I activate cohesion, they will sort of head inwards the flock and focus the beam. Let's watch it play. <laughs> That's it, we have voids. That's the basics anyway. <laughs> what features can we add on top of this to improve the behavior of our flocks? Firstly, collider avoidance. We're not running an army of ghost birds here. The easiest way I found to do this is to fetch all the overlapping colliders from the current position within a certain radius. And then it works just like the separation rule, colliders exert a force on voids. It only works for smallish colliders because you only get the pivot of each collider and not the actual points that are close to you, but it works fine at the moment. For the hard way to do this, which is a lot more accurate at the cost of some performance, check out Sebastian Lake's video on voids. And also, I wanted to add a steering rule to encourage exploration, just to avoid voids swimming around in the same spot. So I added some sort of fog of war and got to developing a rule that pushes towards the fog. The way I did that is by adding a field of fog probes so you have a bunch of probes spanning the entirety of the world, or at least the area that the boids can explore. A probe is simply an object that tracks, using a boolean, whether or not it has been discovered. If a boid touches it, it toggles. And then we add a simple rule that works exactly like the separation rule, but in reverse, boids are attracted to non-discovered probes. To fetch the probes that are next to a boid, we iterate through the list of every probe and filter them based on the radius, like for the neighboring boids. And that's where the problems start. You see, it's the second time we iterate through the full list of something to get neighboring objects. And since every void scans the list of every of the void, that's an n-square complexity. And that's bad. Especially if you want to have, say, 1000 voids. Even for a simple distance check. And I'm not just saying that as an optimization freak. Currently, 15 boys run at 3 FPS of my computer. That's bad. 
So this is a perfect opportunity, and some might even say I did it on purpose because I like talking about cool data structures, to implement a quad tree. Yay! What's a quad tree? It's a type of tree that helps partition a 2D space to effectively store and retrieve objects based on their position. It splits the space into four quadrants, and those are also split into four quadrants, and so on. And the bottom tiles store a list of objects, in our case voids, that are present on the tile. And we can prune some of these. For instance, this big tile has no voids on it, so there's no point in splitting it. This one also, and this one, and basically every tile that doesn't store objects. Also, if there is a single void in a quadrant, there's no need to split it all the way down to level 5 or whatever. We're just splitting a quadrant when its contents are above an arbitrary capacity threshold where we feel they need to split. For instance, 3. So to find the neighbors of a void, we just have to query the list of objects on the same tiles and maybe a few neighboring tiles. Looking up in the tree is super fast because, based on the position, you can progressively narrow down which tile the void is on. For the complexity nerd, that's a logarithmic complexity, which is way more acceptable than what we had before. So we can store voids in a quad tree, and already things are improving because instead of filtering the entire list of every void in existence to find neighbors, voids can now find neighbors super quickly. Same thing for the fog probes. Instead of having every void scan every probe, we can store the probes in another quad tree and have every void scan an easily accessible list of neighboring probes. This takes us from 3 FPS for 15 voids to 20 FPS for 1000 voids. It's good, but not good enough. The next step is parallelization. Right now we're computing the steering forces of every void sequentially, when by definition, as I said earlier, each void is independent from the others, meaning we could have a thread per void, or more realistically a thread for a batch of 100 voids, doing the calculation to speed things up. Now the collider rule cannot be threaded. Physics stuff must be called from the main thread. But separation, alignment, cohesion and fog can all be moved through a thread, provided you cache some of the values like transformers and such. Unity has been kind enough to sponsor this video because we're going to talk about the new async await features available in Unity 2023. Async functions have been available in Unity for a while, but they haven't been very useful so far compared to coroutines. That is, before Unity 2023 introduced awaitables. Now, async functions are on par with coroutines and beyond. Let's do a quick review. You can mark a function as async by just adding async before declaring it. From there, you can call it from any function and it will execute asynchronously, which means the original caller will not wait for the completion of the function before moving on. If you do want to wait for completion, use the await keyword in front of the function call, provided the caller is also an async function, and declare the return type of your async function as task. Now, what can you do inside an async function? Well, you get the usual features you'd get in a coroutine, waiting for an async operation such as loading a scene, skipping a frame, or waiting for a certain time. You can also launch a bunch of other async functions at once, store them to keep track of them, and then use task.whenAll to wait for all of them to complete instead of waiting on each sequentially. <laughs> on top of that, you can finally properly return data, something that was not easy to do with coroutines. Let's say I want to return a boolean. I can declare an async function like so, and simply return my boolean as usual. The caller gets the boolean result like this, it's much more readable than the coroutine alternative. The awaitable class also gives you extra tools, like the ability to wait not just for the next frame or end of frame, but also for the next fixed update. That's a big plus if you want to do physics stuff in your async function. But to me the killer feature is the background thread async awaitable that simply takes your async function and puts it on another thread. That makes it so easy to parallelize stuff, do some heavy computation in the background like pathfinding, and then when you're ready to go back, just call await.mainThreadAsync. Super easy way to set up threaded work. Back to my problem, I set up a kinda janky way to parallelize the computation. I split the load into batches of voids and created one async task for each batch. By varying the size of the batches, and thus the number of threads, I can find the right balance between many small threads and few large threads. So I used that, which in my case though, is probably not what I should have used, because it would have worked better to set up a pool of worker threads using the Unity job system, but I wanted to try this new and easy way to do it, so... Results! 
We went from 20 FPS to 45 FPS with 1000 voids. That's pretty nice, we'll take that. Beyond that, we could add some tricks, like not updating every void at every frame, half of the flock on even frame and the other half on odd frames. Or we could move everyone to the GPU and use a compute shader because it's extremely good at exactly what we're trying to make and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> but right now, we don't want to make better boys, we want to make 3D boys. And for this, we just have to liberate the third dimension of our boys to allow them to go everywhere and they should do just fine, provided we convert our quad tree to an oct tree. Which is the same thing, but instead of splitting a 2D rectangle into four quadrants, we split a 3D volume into eight uh, octants? It does take a bit of tinkering, especially since I wanted to unify my quad tree and oct tree classes under one main class that contains all the common logic, but after that's done, we can feast our eyes on some mother flocking birds. And that's it, I love Boids, they're cool, it's nice to see how we can sort of replicate Hive behavior easily on our computers, and I liked making this. I hope you enjoyed watching as well, and I'll see you in the next one, until then, check out the Patreon for the source code and join the Discord to chat about stuff, show the video to a friend who might like it, and overall have a good one, bye!